into the virulent anti-metaphysics of logical positivism. They were astounded to find that Wittgenstein himself was a deeply spiritual man. They should have been warned. The Tractatus has a prevalent strain of cryptic mysticism. It is not how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. By way of an explanation, Wittgenstein claimed that what he had not said in the Tractatus was much more important than what he had said. The best minds in Central Europe listened in baffled silence as the modern saint, who couldn't exist, attempted to explain what he hadn't said, which couldn't be said. This philosophical Indian rope trick led Wittgenstein to realize that perhaps he hadn't quite succeeded in killing off philosophy after all. This was a unique event. Never before had a major philosopher admitted, even to himself, that his philosophy was wrong. But Wittgenstein characteristically went one step further. Since his philosophy was wrong, all philosophy was obviously wrong. He now embarked on his second attempt to destroy philosophy once and for all. In 1929 he returned to Cambridge. The only philosopher in the world who could possibly have understood what he was talking about was Russell, and it quickly became clear to Russell that he had no idea what Wittgenstein was talking about. The faculty decided to admit Wittgenstein as a fellow of Trinity College all the same, despite the fact that he hadn't even taken a degree. Wittgenstein lectured at Cambridge for the next eighteen years, all the while typically belabouring himself for doing something so dishonest, and describing philosophy as a kind of living death. In his lectures he began elaborating his new philosophy, or anti-philosophy. These are the legendary lectures that were held in Wittgenstein's ascetically bare rooms, which can still be seen in Hewell's court at Trinity College, overlooking a quiet little courtyard with a lawn and a bronze statue of a naked youth. The only ornament in Wittgenstein's rooms was a safe, where he kept the papers containing the philosophy that no one else could understand. The chosen few who were permitted to attend Wittgenstein's lectures were required to bring their own deck-chairs. They would sit in silence while Wittgenstein held his head, thinking. Occasionally, with every appearance of extreme effort, the philosopher would deliver himself of a thought. With anyone else but Wittgenstein, this would have been a farcically pretentious demonstration of original thinking, but all who were present agreed that the atmosphere was electric. Occasionally Wittgenstein would grill one of his students, who included some of the best brains in Cambridge, the usual lonely intellectual young men, and in later years a black U.S. Air Force man who wandered in uninvited one day and was asked to stay because of his cheery face. Meanwhile, professors from Cornell and elsewhere who had crossed the Atlantic to hear Wittgenstein frequently were refused admittance. All are agreed that when Wittgenstein interrogated one of his students on a philosophical point, the nearest equivalent was the Spanish Inquisition. Wittgenstein had a personality of such domineering force that he reduced his audience to a state of terror. The only man who was known to have stood up to him was Turing, inventor of the computer and one of the finest mathematicians of the age, who was later forced to abandon his mathematical career to help win World War II by cracking the Germans' Enigma Code. During one of Wittgenstein's lectures he suggested that a system such as logic or mathematics could remain valid even if it contained a contradiction. Turing disagreed. There was no point in building a bridge with mathematics that contained a hidden contradiction, or the bridge might fall down. Wittgenstein refused to accept this. Empirical considerations played no part in logic, but Turing refused to be browbeaten, and went on insisting that the bridge would fall down. The parallel with the application of Wittgenstein's philosophy to real life provides interesting food for thought. During his time at Cambridge, Wittgenstein became something of a monstre sacre for the university. He would turn up at the weekly meetings of the Philosophical Club and monopolize the discussions, aggressively destroying the arguments of professors and undergraduates alike. He remained intensely lonely, but managed to form a few relationships with his lonely intellectual young men, one of whom he ended up living with. Invariably he dominated these relationships, which were for the most part platonic, but he often caused great harm to his companions. 
he would insist that they give up their academic pursuits and live a life of Tolstoyan simplicity, working in a local factory or becoming a hospital porter. At the outbreak of World War II, Wittgenstein too became a hospital porter. Fortunately, his highly placed friends at the university had managed to secure for him British nationality, but he suffered deeply over the fact that he was safe while his sisters remained in Nazi-occupied Vienna. The Wittgensteins were Jewish, and despite being the Austrian equivalent of the Rothschilds, their safety was far from assured. Ludwig was not the only one to inherit the Wittgenstein trait of principled arrogance. When a Nazi official informed his sister that the Wittgensteins need have no fear they would be classified as Jews, she was highly indignant. No mere upstart was about to tell the Wittgensteins what they were or were not, and she insisted upon papers certifying that she was of Jewish blood. In 1944 Wittgenstein returned to Cambridge, and began preparing for publication a manuscript containing his new philosophy. This was to be called Philosophical Investigations, and was finally published in 1953. This, and the Tractatus, which he now disowned, were to be the only two books that Wittgenstein prepared for publication during his lifetime. More than half a dozen works appeared posthumously. These were made up of lecture notes taken by his students, and several notebooks from the famous Safe. Some have found it symbolic that this safe was the only luxury that Wittgenstein permitted himself during his long ascetic period. The man who longed for clarity in both his life and work kept many dark secrets locked within him. Similarly, others have commented on the resemblance between his pronouncement, what we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence, and his attitude toward his homosexuality. A life so intense as Wittgenstein's is bound to be rich in such parallels. But here we are perhaps better off following another of his famous remarks. Little that is meaningful can be said about such matters. They can only be shown. In comparison to the Tractatus, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations is a bitter disappointment. The lucid clarity and daring of the Tractatus is replaced by nitpicking logical analysis of particular sensations and the meaning of words. There is no such thing as philosophy any more, just philosophizing, which consists of unravelling mistakes in our thinking. These arise through linguistic errors. Language is not a picture of the world, it is like a net that consists of many pieces of interconnected string. Our understanding becomes knotted when we misuse a word in a situation to which it does not apply. The duty of philosophy is painstakingly to unravel these knots. This is why philosophy is now so complex and so boring. The long and glorious tradition of philosophy and its profound questions which formed an integral part of our culture are now reduced to linguistic rummaging. Wittgenstein's later philosophy has recently been compared to the superstring theory in science, which states that the fundamental subatomic particles that make up the universe are like pieces of interlocking string. This comparison is false. Only one of these cat's-cradle theories could possibly prove interesting. Having created his second philosophy, Wittgenstein went off once again to become a saint. He lived for a while in a remote cottage in the west of Ireland, where he did his thinking and fed the seagulls. But he soon became too ill to live such an austere life, and began staying with various friends in England and America. Eventually, cancer was diagnosed, and he died in Cambridge on April 29, 1951. Although never a church-going Christian, he had requested a Catholic burial. His grave— with its suitably plain tombstone giving simply his name and dates, can be seen in the grassy, pleasantly unkempt graveyard of St. Giles's Church, which is a mile up the Huntingdon Road from the church itself. When I visited this spot on a cold, misty February afternoon, the borders of Wittgenstein's grave had been planted by an admirer with little winter-flowering pansies, which almost certainly would not have met with the aesthetic approval of its occupant. The gravestone itself was slightly scuffed, suggesting the rather clumsy, or possibly disrespectful, attentions of undergraduates. 
To this day, the notorious philosophicide continues to attract his uncalled-for devotees. Afterward Wittgenstein outlined his legacy in the unpublished foreword to his philosophical remarks. There he explains that his philosophy is intended only for those who are in sympathy with the spirit in which it was written. As Russell observed, Wittgenstein had the pride of Lucifer, but he also possessed the spiritual fanaticism of a saint. What is good is also divine. Queer as it sounds, that sums up my ethics. Only something supernatural can express the supernatural. He was determined he would live his life on this level or not at all. The continual question of suicide was not merely a psychological inheritance, it was a moral problem. Wittgenstein was aware that this attitude was not in the spirit of the main current of European and American civilization. Although he may have been the greatest philosopher of the twentieth century, he spent his entire life in conflict with it. He found the industry, architecture, and music of our time, in its fascism and socialism, alien and uncongenial. Characteristically, he insisted, this is not a value judgment. In such matters, he evidently considered himself to be above matters of mere human taste, or even of history. Despite this, he went on to make what look curiously like value judgments about many aspects of modern culture. He refused to accept what nowadays passes for architecture as architecture. His own effort in this field is passed over in silence. He viewed what is called modern music with the greatest suspicion, though without understanding its language. This confession does not appear to be one of modesty, but rather an indication that he considered himself above such matters, and it certainly doesn't prevent him from passing more sweeping judgments where arrogance is tempered with apparent compassion. The disappearance of the arts does not justify judging disparagingly the human beings who make up this civilization. In times like this, genuine strong characters abandon the arts and turn to other things, such as putting an end to philosophy, perhaps. We are presented with the unimpressive spectacle of a crowd whose best members work for purely private ends— in an age that saw the rise of popular democracy and the liberation of vast numbers of downtrodden humanity, he observed, I have no sympathy for the current of European civilization and do not understand its goals, if it has any. But he did concede that the disappearance of a culture does not signify the disappearance of human value, but simply of certain means of expressing this value. Having dispensed with the cultural expression of human values, Wittgenstein introduced a philosophy that insisted we must remain silent about such matters. He left humanity gagged. Despite his protests to the contrary, Wittgenstein was curiously in accord with the spirit of his age. During his time, human values were largely determined by those who had no use for philosophy, the populists and demagogues who shaped the public ethos of the twentieth century. In the private realm, be it called spiritual or personal, things remain more problematic. As a consequence of Wittgenstein's philosophy, the questions once asked by philosophy have now passed into the realms of poetry. The way poetry is going, it looks as if they won't be asked much longer here, either. We have learned to do without God, and it looks as if we will learn to do without philosophy. It will now, alas, join the ranks of subjects which are completed, and have become completely spurious, such as alchemy, astrology, platonic love, and stylitism. From Wittgenstein's Writings Wittgenstein opens his Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus with two striking remarks. 1. The world is all that is the case. 1.1. The world is the totality of facts, not of things. He then argues, 1.12. For the totality of facts determines what is the case, and also whatever is not the case. 1.13. The facts in logical space are the world. This leads on to, 2. What is the case, a fact, is the existence of states of affairs. 2.01. 
A state of affairs, a state of things, is a combination of objects, things. He then claims 2.012. In logic, nothing is accidental. If a thing can occur in a state of affairs, the possibility of the state of affairs must be written into the thing itself. Later he states his ethical position. Six point into the virulent anti-metaphysics of logical positivism. They were astounded to find that Wittgenstein himself was a deeply spiritual man. They should have been warned. The Tractatus has a prevalent strain of cryptic mysticism. It is not how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. By way of an explanation, Wittgenstein claimed that what he had not said in the Tractatus was much more important than what he had said. The faculty decided to admit Wittgenstein as a fellow of Trinity College all the same, despite the fact that he hadn't even taken a degree. Wittgenstein lectured at Cambridge for the next eighteen years, all the while typically belabouring himself for doing something so dishonest, and describing philosophy as a kind of living death. In his lectures he began elaborating his new philosophy, or anti-philosophy. These are the the best minds in Central Europe listened in baffled silence as the modern saint, who couldn't exist, attempted to explain what he hadn't said, which couldn't be said. This philosophical Indian rope trick led Wittgenstein to realise that perhaps he hadn't quite succeeded in killing off philosophy after all. This was a unique event. Never before had a major philosopher admitted, even to himself, that his philosophy was wrong but Wittgenstein characteristically went one step further. Since his philosophy was wrong, all philosophy was obviously wrong. He now embarked on his second attempt to destroy philosophy once and for all. In 1929 he returned to Cambridge. The only philosopher in the world who could possibly have understood what he was talking about was Russell, and it quickly became clear to Russell that he had no idea what Wittgenstein was talking about. Legendary lectures that were held in Wittgenstein's ascetically bare rooms, which can still be seen in Hewell's court at Trinity College, overlooking a quiet little courtyard with a lawn and a bronze statue of a naked youth. The only ornament in Wittgenstein's rooms was a safe, where he kept the papers containing the philosophy that no one else could understand. The chosen few who were permitted to attend Wittgenstein's lectures were required to bring their own deck chairs.